have to do a bunch of voices. I already know we have to do a bunch of voices. It'd be a, a, sh- a shame. <laughs> no, no, we've got to do a bunch of voices. It would just be a shame if we had you here and didn't do a bunch of voices. I hear you. Thank you for um, using this valuable resource that, uh, that you know. How did you get into voice work and or dialect work? And how did that pivot to democracy work? (laughs) Well, uh, that's part of what the story of my first podcast is going to be about. If I can get it finished in time to upload it for the January 6th launch date. If not, we're going to just do a live webcast of Freedom of Speech, the show that we're doing over here at the Abbey on on Saturday, as well as, you know, the the panel discussion, which will be vital and relevant and all very exciting. But um, the story goes, I uh, quit acting. I Well, so I got into dialects um, because my dad speaks in different dialects just as a form of expression. You know, if he wants you to clean your room, it's, you know, or if he wants you to get to the table, it's get to the table, you ugly anthropomorphic pigs, you know. So we we had to uh, adapt. And, and I always sort of thought of it as just another form of emotional expression. Um, and also I think because I'm a Suzuki violinist, so I had this ear training uh, method that I ended up using to teach other actors to do dialects and accents, um, turned it into sort of a concise looping method that I use with a DAW to take on, you know, a Sri Lankan soldier or whatever I need to do for my my day job, the voiceover stuff for the video games um, instantly, you know, really fast. Cause, cause you, you know, the study of dialects traditionally in academia is kind of a long, arduous left brain process where you have to learn to speak in code. Like literally, it's the international phonetic alphabet. And it kind of, t- in my experience with other actors and with myself, it takes you out of the process. But um, I'm digressing and rambling. Uh, you no, asked this me is good. This is to- good. What's the video games? What are your three oh. favorite video games, either because you enjoy the video game the most or because you enjoy your performance in it the most or because you're the most proud of being part of that video game that you voiced? Choice. Just a lot. Of it doesn't have to be the three, but just three That's examples. a lot of conditions. They're all different, you know. Um, I loved doing Maid of Windermere because I love that Irish accent. Um, I forget what game that was for. Uh, I liked Final Fantasy a lot because I liked Arisha's outfit. Um, and I loved overdubbing Japanese just because I love listening to Japanese. Um, I really like doing gnomes, trolls, mecha gnomes. You know, like usually when I do a World of Warcraft, I get to do five completely different species. So that's fun. And I just love that they decided to use like a, a New York 30s Abbott and Costello accent for some of their mecha gnomes. You know, <laughs> it's just like so silly. Oh, I also really enjoyed Skylanders. Same thing. We used a sort of New York accent for the, the worms that were getting stepped on. Oh, well, just, oh, it's no problem. I'm fine. You know, in addition to you know batspin who batspin's the only one i got an actual action figure for so she's she's on my altar representing you know the uh undead zone um and witchiness oh this computer with its constant restarting due to a problem you might hear that periodically i i'm on my backup computer kingdoms of amalur i don't know if i'm pronouncing it correctly seems to be the video game that had the maid or has maybe yeah. present tense or yeah. perpetual yeah. tense yeah. uh the uh, includes the maid of windermere yeah i love her and and i loved decibel sly cooper she's like the description was you are an elephant with a trumpet stuck in your in your tusk no in your in your what's the prehensile um trunk oh <laughs> Trump is stuck in your trunk. You are also the Queen of Arabia, and you happen to have a posh British accent. And she sounds like this, you know, which is sort of the same voice I did for um, Neil deGrasse Tyson's uh, Cosmos for this teacher that was, Haley couldn't say his ahs. That's not how you say your ahs. You know, those are just a really fun. And she got to sing. She broke glass, you know. Ah! It was great fun, great fun. Um <laughs> Is there a dialect for you that's the hardest? Is or you know are there two or three that are particularly challenging for you? Don't ask me to do them. Well, you can do. I could. I'll ask you to do your favorites instead of your hardest. But I am curious if there's a hardest. Welsh 
Welsh is difficult. Welsh, Welsh is confounding. And Vietnamese is like, they just laugh at me when I try to speak Vietnamese, and which is ironic because I actually have noticed this across the board with people I coach as well, that if you um, grew up around certain sounds, it's very diff difficult for even a dialect coach like myself to distinguish the sounds I grew up around as distinctive and you know, defining. So this is why when you ask an actor who whose mom is Japanese to do a Japanese accent, they kind of do it, but they're kind of in this limbo. You know, expats who've lived here for a while tend to be in this limbo. Oh, they don't pass as a local back home anymore, and they don't pass as a local here in North America. There's something, but they can't quite identify it. And it's because when you grow up with these sounds around you, your brain selects them as normal, and it's really hard to distinguish them. So, so for me, um, Minnesotan is hard for me to coach because sometimes oat and a boat just come out, <laughs> and I don't notice it. Uh, and also, you know, originally identifying that I was even doing the uh, Great Lakes I sound with, you know, I'd like a piece of pie instead of I'd like a piece of pie when I try to do a New York accent, you know, a New York City accent or a Jewish New York East Side. East Side has this awe in the back where you like drop your tongue in the back, all whereas the Great Lakes is like, hi, hey, hi, hey, like a glass of water, you know. So um, these are distinctions that because I grew up around them, they're difficult for me. But Welsh in particular escaped me for a while. I think I'm, I've got it now. Um, honestly, anything I haven't transcribed, listened to, studied, and memorized like I do with the music, you know, anything I haven't practiced like I would the violin isn't with me, you know? Um, but but I, it takes, you know, it's a process and, and I teach the process and I've, I've distilled it to its essence. So it takes about three days to really master this looping method where you- Three days for like, you or three days for someone you coach? Three days for my students to eliminate 90% of my dialect coaching time. So if it weren't already obvious, Eliza Jane Schneider is a voice actor and dialect coach. Her clients include former Oscar winners. She's done- Things in video games we talked about. She had characters in South Park. She is also the creator of the Internet Dialect Database, travels around the world to capture samples of authentic dialects. I'm fascinated by the topic, so we're going to dig into that in the areas that it is obviously overlapping with democracy and the places where the overlap is seen by maybe either of us, maybe neither of us. Yeah. She's joining us now to talk about a number of things, including her one-person performance, Freedom of Speech which is going to bring to life over 7,000 interviews that she's conducted around the world on the topic of free speech. Performance suggests or promises to be anthropological in nature, a look at American culture through conversation. She is planning on kicking off a freedom of speech podcast on January 6th. I don't think the date is an accident. Welcome to democracy nerd. <laughs> Eliza Jane Schneider. Do you prefer all three names or is there a shortened version that you prefer? I like Eliza Jane because I'm still hung up on this whole like patriarchal, patriarchal ownership thing. Like I can't figure out that whole last name of a bunch it, of it, dudes. It is, a, it, is, dudes. it is an ingrained cultural flaw that there is no, I at least have no clear res perpetual response to, lasting yeah. solution to. Yeah, well, I mean, I always imagined that I would pick a new last name for for me and my family and like we would pick one together and that would be our family name because I like the idea of being part of a little tribe. Yeah, you know, it all has the same name and stuff. That's very empowering. But choosing that name is the uh, has escaped me. I mean, Schneider sounds like something that hangs off the end of your nose. I have a Schneider. You know what I mean? Well, he, he, and he was the, he was the super, I didn't know what a super was, but he was the super in the what was the, it was the TV show, right? Yeah. And he had cigarettes in his pocket and the cigarettes, yeah, his his cigarettes rolled up in his sleeve, which incidentally, um, the rat guy on that show Beekman's world that I did in the early nineties decided to do the same thing for children's television. It was one of our little rebellious little quirks. We also had the guy, uh, we had Beekman call the prop guy who put on the, uh, gorilla, gorilla hands and handed him some prop. He said, thank you, Eve, because we weren't allowed to discuss evolution on Beekman's world. Um, but anyways, I digressed again. I'll be doing that. It's all to the good. America <laughs> has a founding principle that is about speech. Yeah. It's a moral purpose for the revolution that you mm. couldn't, you can't, you shouldn't be tossed into a dungeon for criticizing governmental leaders. 
right? There are other liberties and freedoms essentially the United essentially the United States. But when the founders were spitballing what a new country should be, they decided that the first thing should be the protection of speech. Yeah. However, is there such a thing as too much free speech? Is there are there if there are guardrails or regulations placed on speech to this result in speech being less free? I want to talk about that topic in general, and it's an honor to have you. I do want to dig in a little bit more about dialects. What's your favorite? Do you have one that is your go-to? And maybe well, your go-to is love... one that sounds the most true for you. I So I when I discuss, you know, dialects and accents, for me, it's more, it's people. You can't separate the sound of a voice from the voice of a person. So when, when I teach, I have my students uh, do very precise voice matches similar to what I had to do with Mary Kay Bergman on South Park for all those characters just just very precise <laughs> we actually call Disney Mauschwitz Disney character voices because like even when you get you know Kira Knightley's voice like 99% there there and you're like that signal is over a thousand feet high. The entire world knows that looking for me. Do you really think there's even the slightest chance they won't see it? And then and then the director's like, do that jaw thing. You're almost there, you know. Um, to get very, very precise on a dialect, you asked me what my favorite one was. My favorite one is is an actual person that I that I took on, and she's actually in the play, and it's because of her laugh more than her dialect, but it's the texture of her voice and how it intermingles with the non-rhotic, R-dropping plantation Southern, which which is shared by what is called now AAVE, which is African American Vernacular English, which is essentially, you know, how they speak on the plantations, you know, uh, white or black. And so um, it's uh, something along the lines of, is that an ambulance you're driving? I, <laughs> I think that's just wonderful. That's my favorite. That's my favorite. I should I should have a clapping. I, I should have a clapping. That's the wrong one. Okay, terrific. I should have a clapping button that I just has a pause. Clap. Yes, you should. You should. What kind of an interface are you using? It's a it's a road. It, yeah, it has cool. buttons, but it doesn't have enough. And I, I don't load anything onto them. There are never enough buttons, Jefferson. There are never enough. Where does doing a dialect and doing an impression overlap? Where does it separate? So technically, a dialect is defined as a distinction in three things, pronunciation, grammar, and vocabulary. Whereas an accent is technically defined as simply a distinction in pronunciation but i mean just the other day yahoo news was asking me to weigh in on the quote influencer accent and and people in common usage will refer to any way of speaking as an accent and what they were referring to is this kind of hey guys up speak and you know <laughs> it's a very specific melody um so the for me an impression or a voice match is i actually use this looping method to, to it's what i do is i take a phone number sized piece of a native speaker like with that woman it would be is that an ambulance you're driving and i loop it in my daw 14 times i mute numbers four six eight and ten where I will have the exact same amount of time to sort of chant and I get into a chant. I pan the native speaker all the way to the right, which puts it into my left. No, I'm sorry. I pan it all the way to the left, which puts it into my right hemisphere of my brain, which I can sort of get as most like intuitively like a baby in the wild. And then I pan my own voice as I record on the second track all the way to the right goes into my left brain so when i listen back i can kind of simultaneously analyze although there's those who argue that those two hemispheres work mutually exclusively which is why actors have a hard time acting when they're editing themselves on the stage um but anyways this the process works for me and some of the brain science applies and um what you end up ha having is like a little three minute kind of recording a practice recording that you can work with for three times for three days and then and then I just take on everything, like the texture, the timbre, the lilt, the the musicality, and the elements of pronunciation. You know, the what they call sound substitutions, where you know they'll say they'll say um, 
I for my ah, where I'll say rash, she'll say rash, you know, and that goes from an ah, which is like your widest front vowel and is uh, the phonetic symbol is a typeset lowercase a, and it goes all the way up to one of the most narrow front vowels, which is a t capital I, I, I is the name of that sound. So rash for her is I, and rash for me is spelled phonetically like a, a typeset lowercase a squished back to back with the typeset lowercase e and that's an ah sound so so it can get very 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 technical but it's also you know with this looping method that's kind of how i pull actors out of all that technical stuff and you said so. that maybe that's what you mean by the technical stuff you said that the and and i've already lost the vocabulary for it but you said well there's sort of a official way of doing this but it tends to take people out of the performance because it seems to be about breaking it down getting your left brain to do it rather than by hearing it and then seeing if you can say the thing and i played the piano as a kid i i could it was hard for me to read music right i mean i understood what it meant but i couldn't go from reading music to playing but if my music teacher would play the song i could play it yeah and it yeah. and it's the so same the like when i playing by ear, spitting it right back like a baby in the wild, exactly what you hear. And yeah. and having so little time to do that that you can't think about it and analyze it first. And certainly taking it by ear as opposed to reading it. Like, don't transcribe it first, just listen. And that's why it's a phone number sized piece so that you can grab it and repeat it, grab it and repeat it and just repeat it. And then your body and your mouth just your vocal posture forms to that of of whom you are imitating or doing an impression of. And that that's why it helps me with the actors that I have to coach because they've already adjusted sort of subconsciously by this chant, um, their vocal posture just by ear. So we go by ear first, we do the auditory, then the kinesthetic, then if necessary, there may be two or three things like for example, that Rochesterian long I sound that I still was putting into my New York City accent and I can write that down give them that one phonetic symbol to memorize and they can score their copy with it and we're done. Did it start and by it I mean you becoming a dialect coach which I must have known existed or if I'd thought about it for more than a moment I would know it existed but it's not something I've ever needed or at least I didn't know that I needed it right it's not anything I've ever called or looked up in the phone book and I'm fascinated by it and so I assume you're I mean I know that if it's Oscar winners it's not because you're teaching accountants to do this stuff I assume that it's largely entirely actors it might be other it might be other walks of life if so I'm curious how did that did it start because as an actor yourself, you were good with voices and people said, how do you do those voices? And she said, well, I could show you. Yeah. How did it, what was, who was your first coaching? Who was your first student? My first student? Well, I started just helping people in the waiting room at William Morris because William Morris was notorious for having us sit around and wait for like three hours for an audition because they just get such a, a, a ton of auditions. Big response. To go in. And so... I, I would just sit there and I'd listen to my fellow actors like trying on these accents that they just gave them right then and there. Like that was my big shock when I went from theater school, you know, where you have six months to perfect your character, you know, to the real world where they're like, okay, can you do South African go? Oh, we don't like that. Can you do, um, you know, Australian, you know, or whatever it is. And then you have to, in this competitive environment, you have to be able to say, okay, would you like Adelaide or Brisbane or something more like Darwin? And what's the socioeconomic class? So that's what I teach my actors in my online masterclass to do. I have the dialect masterclass online. Um, but in the, when I first started, you know, it was more a dearth of authentic source material that inspired me to get into what, what the byproduct was teaching, but the the impetus was research because when I first studied dialects, I was at the Northwestern University's National High School Institute, which was this sort of summer program with the creme de la creme of every theater acting program high school. And so there, it was full of divas. I hid behind my guitar the whole time because I had extreme social anxiety and they double cast me as Antigone with some woman. And, you know, I had one of my first, some girl, uh, she was brilliant. And, you know, I had one of my first scary encounters with an acting teacher who tried to rip me to shreds and he just stood there and was like what makes you think you should be able to play antigone after that performance <laughs> i think you know maybe coaching 
is more appealing certainly now when I'm tired and I don't feel like being a performing monkey all the time. You know, I just use you the seem same shy. knowledge base to just help others soar. You know, I, I always say that acting is like flying, but teaching is like working real your ass off to get your pilot's license and taking 350 people somewhere they couldn't have gone without you. And that's just a whole other level of satisfying. So, um, but no, the, the, they, all there was for dialects when I studied at National High School Institute was Dr. David Allen Stern imitating people from everywhere on cassettes, his own voice doing the, the and I was like, well, where, where can we find, and this was pre-internet, you know, so searching everywhere, libraries for recordings of, of people from everywhere, and it, it, there was very little source material. So I went out in the ambulance and I and I went and re- tried to record everybody in America, starting with America, even though it didn't thrill me so that I could, you know, not be completely ignorant about where I came from and then go to the more interesting places, especially where I ended up in the late aughts, you know, in the places where tonal languages intersect with English and like in, in Singapore, where you've got four different mother tongues on the subways, you know, Malay. Um, English, Tamil, and um, what's the other one? A uh, Mandarin, uh, and then and then the Singlish. You know these kids, these teenagers that sit in the the trains. They sort of it's akin to doing the dozens where they they try to catch each other with throwing in words from their own mother tongue, and it's all about economy of verbiage. It's like, um, hey, where do you guys want to go for lunch? Is what eat la? You know, so um, so I just I, I just adore the intersection of music and language, and and so studying the accents of spoken English, the tonal ones, like like Vietnamese, which will confound me forever, but but it's exciting to uh, to explore. Have you ever counted? Do you have any idea how many dialects you have done yourself, or coached, or know, or understand? I mean, that's kind of like asking how many songs a musician who's been playing for. 40 years has played. Yeah. Right? Okay. So how many songs so, have you played? A lot. <laughs> a lot. A lot of songs. Let's get into your performance. And I think when you're saying going around and capturing these recordings is part of the process of making the performance. I, th- it sounds like this wasn't the example. And by the way, I hope this is interesting to everybody else. It's deeply interesting to me. My professor, my my grandfather, I never met, passed away before I was, I, I was born, was a college professor in speech and theater. And there's a, there's an, there's an un, unreached part of my soul that is, that is spoken to by the way you have spent your life and what you do. So I, I, I am curious about it and fascinated by it and appreciate it very much. It sounds like in your building up to this performance, it was very much not like the William Morris audition where you get a few seconds or even not just like the six months you were talking about for theater. But this has been something that has been years in the making. Yeah. Yeah. So, well, you had originally asked me where the crossover was. I mean, you asked me the big question at the beginning and I only digressed into like three or four tangents. But um, from dialects to uh, politics. Um, I think it was a very natural transition because when you go out searching for esoteric phonemes, you're going to find esoteric points of view. My first title for my first one woman show was not freedom of speech. It was, I'm not weird American perspectives because everyone thought I would think that they were weird and I could not find a mainstream America to save my life. No one thought they were part of the mainstream. Everyone felt marginalized, disenfranchised, as though their voice and their vote didn't count. And um, the pivotal moment was um, in 2004, I had just done Freedom of Speech at the Fringe Festival and it won Best Solo Show. It was all very exciting. And, um, you know, I was being courted by Broadway directors and one of them who directed uh, John Leguizamo's Freak um, was trying to sort of rewrite these verbatim transcriptions of human beings. Like my guy from the reservation where I grew up, Jack Hart, who said, art might be the thing that brings the world together. And, you know, this money system's all gonna come crashing down sooner or later, you know? And all these great things, great things to say and very prescient. This is 30 years ago, you know, and um, he like wrote all these like fried beaver jokes, like mad TV caricatures. And I was just like, if I have to sell out to this extent in order to take my my play to the next level, I quit, I quit, I quit, I quit, I quit. And so I quit acting and I 
dropped out. I joined the Kerry campaign in New York and I started raising money on the street to go to Ohio and try to help get all the 250,000 registered voters to the polls in Columbus, which was the pivotal precinct in the pivotal state, swing state. And um, I witnessed this systemic disenfranchisement of the African-American community and all the, the poor people in, in Columbus. And I stuck around afterwards when the mainstream media took off and Kerry conceded. And we all knew that there were 150,000 provisional ballots still uncounted. And, and we were around there and the, on the streets. And I went to the, the community public hearings, which you know I just found my mini discs of, um, and recorded people and tried to get their voices heard. So that the plays, the one person shows have always been, you know, using this kind of dog and pony trick of, you know, doing the different voices, you know, just doing things like that um, to get attention for un unsung voices, people who just are not currently part of the conversation and need to be. And just to kind of J January 6th was chosen to steer the public conversation away from this vocal minority of billionaire followers and toward the question, what kind of a revolution do the American people really want and need? And are, do our votes count? Like, it always bothers me when I hear people advocating for their guy because, you know, my mom's an attorney. My mom's a legal aid attorney, and that's why I grew up on a Chippewa reservation. Uh, she was an what they called Indian law attorney at the time. And, and an attorney is trained to be able to argue either side, right? Like, and, and I feel like I should be able to argue either side. So when I hear somebody saying our guy won and th th this system is flawed, I want to ask, okay, is the system flawed? Let's ask just that one question. It's not about our guy won or your guy won. It's about do we have open, free, fair elections? does your vote count and i think oregon does it really well but jesse jackson back when i was interviewing him in 2004 was saying we have 50 separate unequal election systems you know 50 state separate unequal election systems and and you know he was like in florida you don't have to register and, and even in ohio in that one precinct one of their football strategies was to divert traffic by changing the laws up to within a week of voting where you were supposed to go, whether you were supposed to go where you were registered or where you live, which of course only affects people who move a lot or who are in apartments or who have been evicted or, you know, and so the one voter that I was trying to get to the polls, his vote ended up not being counted because he went to the wrong place because they changed the law four days earlier because Blackwell was the head of the Bush Cheney reelection campaign and the president of the board of elections. And you realized same. then yeah. That you didn't want to give up. I didn't want to give up. Well, I ended up writing that play, um, Sounds of Silence, a documentary puppet musical farce about the 2004 elections in Ohio because sock puppets with the original recordings of the um, Democratic challengers and all the people, you know, these kind of Dadaist, absurdist characters who were rearranging the laws and moving things around to make it just nearly impossible to to actually vote that day they needed sock puppets to get their point across, in my opinion. You're coming to Portland. How come Portland? I live here. You live here all the time. I live so here when now, you... yeah. I'm hiding under a giant sequoia tree in my little recording. And how long have you been in Portland? Um, off and on since 2016. I Very love good. it here. I love the people. I love the music scene. Your life is based on speech. Freedom of speech is deeply important to you. How do you define it? I define free right now. I define freedom of speech as the opposite of cancel culture. Like period, because yeah. I, I feel like people are so quick and removed online to criticize and t tear everyone down, you know, and nobody's actually listening. I think freedom of speech is best defined by Dr. Carl Faber in his quote on listening, which I don't have memorized, but you know, I think it's about the listening freedom. You can't have freedom of speech if no one's listening. And I think that we're so predisposed to have our opinion and dig in our heels. And of course, we've got these little devices that are our pocket pals and best friends that are spitting back advertisements and feeds tailored by billionaire companies to to make sure that we are seeing and hearing our own opinions back at us. And we think that that's public discourse now. I mean, we used to have like at least five news channels that that claimed to be somewhat 
you know, nonpartisan. And so we all kind of thought that that we knew what was going on in the world. And it was the same thing other people thought was going on in the world. But now our listening is so myopic and and individualized that it's like we're all running around in these little bubbles of thought and we don't actually ever get to hear anyone else's point of view you know? <laughs> unless we is, try really hard. Is the Faber quote you're looking for, and, and to be clear, uh, credit the internet, not me, uh, there's a grace of kind listening as well as a grace of kind speaking. Is that the is that the quote? Yeah, you're it for? starts with that. The part of it that I really like is uh, a few paragraphs in. Um, but yes, that's that's the one. Um, trying to remember the exact part of it. I actually put it in my program. If you go to fosplay.com, which will autocorrect to cosplay, so you might have to turn that Z for cat into an F for fantastic. Most people have never really been listened to. They live in a lonely silence, no one knowing what they feel, how they live, or what they have done. They are prisoners of the eyes of others, the stereotyped, limited, superficial, and often distorted ways that others see them. This is lovely. Yeah, it's worth it. We'll, we'll put it. We'll put the link. We'll put the link in the show notes, as they say. Sweet. So you worked on South Park with Matt Stone and Trey Parker, whose careers have largely been established by their desire to push some limits of free speech in, yeah. in a reverent manner. What did you learn about or what did you consider about free speech in that experience? I just feel very empowered by their irreverence. I mean, they nothing, you know. And it's really hard to do that. I remember coming out of uh, the studio one day and it was right around when I did Wendy's cuss song. And I am so proud of having gotten all of those expletives past the FCC. You know, um, I could sing a little bit of it for you now, but please, you in trouble. I, it's the I would Mrs. Welcome. Lambert was a help that she could put in a walk. Mr. Harris was her boyfriend and he had a great big cock a doodle doodle. The rooster just won't quit. I don't like my breakfast because it tastes like shit. Who's make with house fast? They're cuddly and sweet. Monkeys aren't good to have because they like to beat their meaning in the office, a meaning in the hall. And this got on the radio. So I was very proud of that. I was very happy. And I came out of the studio and then sort of stumbled into my my ambulance or whichever van I had at the time. I've been through several. Um, and barefoot, you know, because I was always sort of coming. I was always coming into the studio at two o'clock in the morning the night before broadcast because that's how they rolled. I love them, but you have to kind of be in their group, sure. in their entourage in order to be be OK over there. Yeah. But I came out and, and Matt had just gotten off the phone with standards and practices with Columbia Pictures. And they and Trey was disappointed because they put the kibosh on the context of one of the jokes in that song was like his favorite spot for fishing was in a lady's contaminated water can really make you sick and what what they were told they couldn't do was put it in the context of fishing they couldn't say the c word in the context of fishing but they and i was just sitting there wondering what was up with this woman at standards and practice <laughs> like what her actual issue was but i mean it can be that absurdist right like it's all I don't know. I, I think I, I, I don't want to completely discredit the idea of neuro linguistic programming and like, you know, words having power and being being thoughtful about what you say um, and not appropriate culturally appropriating other people's language and words and music and all the things. I, I totally understand that point of view. And one of the things about the Freedom of Speech podcast is it gives equal credence to everyone's voice. So you know, um, even cancel culture, you know, <laughs> like you can have your opinion there. But I think I think that it's, it's really crippling when people are more concerned with what you're not supposed to say than they are with really trying to hear what somebody's trying to communicate behind the words. You know? The concern, you know, my concern is and it's not mine alone, but I think about the dynamic, or maybe I'm trying to feed back what I heard from you, is that it engenders fear and fear of saying the wrong thing, doing the wrong thing, stepping on the wrong thing. And a little bit of fear can be good. On the other hand, fear is very often the limiter of creativity. It activates our amygdala, it turns off our frontal lobes. It, it makes it harder for us literally to get our brains to integrate and come up with new stuff. If we're trying to figure out how do we not, you know, burn our hand, we're not thinking about how we can invent. Exactly. Yeah. And I was even on the phone with a voice expert this morning, one of my favorite coaches, Yvonne Morley Chisholm, and she was telling me, you know, 
Cause, cause I, I eliminated the N word from one of the scenes in my play and it was the only, um, transcription that I edited. And I just say in the play, Hey, that's not my word. Um, none of these are my words and who am I to take words out of the mouths of other people? Um, you know, but at the same time, that's one that I'm, I'm, that's not my word. So I took it out and, and then I, as an actress, because I've been just replicating exactly the verbatim um what these people have been saying this whole time um it was hard for me to step out of what my muscle memory had for exactly what had been said in that scene and so then i i my voice teacher was like you know don't think about it you know don't get tight because you've got to just let it flow and relax and allow the voice to come through you and not think about the voice. So it, it really, yeah, it, it, any kind of fear or tension, um, can just not only like stop you from doing your play in the first place, you know, cause it's hard enough <laughs> you know, to yeah. do it, to put yeah. your own voice out, let alone try to get other people's voices heard. Um, but you know, one of the things that I'm doing to, um, balance that out is is in this performance on the six you know we've got um people indigenous musicians coming to the panel afterwards and and singing and sharing their music and pretty much you know every culture bearer or ethnic group that i have represented in this in this one person show there's someone from that that um ethnic group or, or, or culture at the end, able to tell their own story, talk about action steps you can take to support, you know, what they're going through and getting their own voice heard. Cause that's elevating the voices is really what, for me, freedom of speech in the context of my podcast is about. It's, it's elevating the unsung, the, the artists without corporate sponsorship, you know, the, the people who, who are not having all this focus on them all the time, who are, who, no, it, it, it's fascinating. I'm glad. I'm glad you brought it up. I'm glad we're talking about it. The and I now realize I have, I have three critiques. So the first is limited creativity, and and so that I'm clear about what I mean. I don't mean, oh, because then you don't get to say the n word, and that limits creativity. That's not what I mean. What I mean is, is that if there's 17 things, or 117 things, or 1,017 things you're worried about, even if you would never want to do those 1,017 things, it might keep your, turn your brain off from doing a very different 2017 things or 20,017 things. So that's the first second. And and this is my, uh, and I, I do worry that it's being used to help build a movement that isn't genuinely about freedom or equality, right? That the, that the, that the backlash around, uh, around it concerns me. I, and I'll tell you, and, and I kind of want to ask where you think it comes from, but I will acknowledge it's a make way to tell you where I, to, to explain where I think it comes from, which is misplaced uh, cheapens it, doesn't give it enough credit. But in a world we are genuinely uh, facing oppression, genuinely facing uh, nearly unprecedented economic inequality, at least in this country, where we are facing more real threats to democracy than we face certainly in my lifetime and maybe our shared lifetime, that uh, there is... There, there, we're seeing a a resurgence of of inside racism coming outside and and thinking that it should carry tiki torches down the street. That there is very legitimate fear, very legitimate concern about oppression, and yeah. if we and and a feeling of powerlessness over these forces. Right. But if yeah, we can go Jew online, right say again. I said, as a Jew right now, you know, and, you know, like my, my husband who is not Jewish is like talking to me about, you know, how are we going to talk to our son about what he's going to experience in his school? You know, um, this, this stuff is new, you know, this wasn't, it, it, it feels different. It yeah. feels different. And, and I think that so many of us and so many people, and and I can include myself or exclude myself because I come from uh, several layers of privilege as well, yeah. that uh, in response to that powerlessness, knowing that if you see the former president of the United States uh, mimicking uh, a, a disabled person, mm -hmm. it, see it, the, pre the former president of the United States when running for president, uh, mimic and, 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 and just, just, just make fun of what we think is war heroes of yeah. 
of having of having his own family with a racist history and knowing that oh as a as a socially progressive activist nobody cares in that movement what you think like nobody you have absolutely no impact to in fact you have reverse power to impact the republican primary if you say oh donald trump is bad the people who think that you're you know a, a pointy-headed liberal will like him better and that in fact has been the dynamic mm -hmm. and so where what do you do you go after targets of opportunity because maybe jk rowling would listen or maybe the fans of jk rowling would listen or maybe dave chappelle would listen or maybe the fans of J of, of dave chappelle would listen or maybe the the president of a university would listen or maybe the board of directors of the president of a university would listen and so you go after targets of opportunity which tend not to be i fear often the targets of real desire of real high priority and so that's part of my concern and and i say that even not merely as a critique, I say that with empathy. That I think that some of what we're seeing is just is just a is a barbaric yawp as a scream against genuine oppression. What I care about is being as intentional with that as we can. Yeah, I I I, I hear everything you're saying, and and I agree. I think um, God, there was so much that I was thinking as you were speaking, and went, forgive me, I spoke, I said several things. No, no, it's it's all right. Um, the otherism is really, I think, the issue, the us versus them, the thing where you're saying, you know, that because you're a pointy headed liberal, people are going to not hear what you're saying, not listen to you. And then you've got to, like, get creative about who might listen to you because of the label that you wear, you know, and and it's interesting because a, a man experiencing houselessness in San, San Francisco was the one who coined this term for me. I'm sure other people have said it, but he said it best and he was like, people play these otherism games, you know, and and otherism is not prejudice, you know, and I just loved that term because it's so pervasive. It's it's always this us versus them. And, you know, anybody in in the kind of, you know, spiritual world will tell you we are all one, you know, we hear this kind of adage, but you know, the, the idea that, that we're so separate and that, you know, you can say, oh, well, you're a liberal, so I'm not going to listen to anything you have to say that, that eclipses that, that shuts, that, that shuts off freedom of speech entirely. There is no freedom of speech in that. The minute you start wearing labels and, and stop listening to people just because of who you think they are or listen to them for purposes of disagreeing attacking or deciding you must think the opposite exactly exactly yeah it's, it's just a whole other kind of listening it's, it's not listening how do you get people to listen to others and to make that listening experience feel not just like listening to others but listening to a broader definition of us okay so here's what i do so so in the play um i take on uh a character and you don't know that this guy is speaks in tongues or is a polygamist. You just get to know a police chief and fireman who loves his family and has a hypnotic, virile, David Koresh-esque delivery. And you get sucked into the beauty of the utopian, you know, this is one of the places in America where you still don't lock your doors at night. You can leave your keys in your car, not even worry about it. No one locks up. And, uh, you know, start thinking communally about marrying your best girl girlfriend into your family. And then you then you find out, you know, that he's a polygamist. Um, so for me, the way I do it is I I have been as of yet unsuccessful in getting red state, blue state conversations where people are talking directly to each other. But I can listen um, with. A, a shockingly open mind and and a, a level of trust that my mom is still concerned and perplexed by um you know like kissing a white supremacist just to watch his reaction when he found out i was a jew incidentally he did a flip and then he ate the chocolate chip cookies i made in my ambulance and we kept talking so um this idea that we are all one what what i do i just like use my physical body and and my my work as an actor my my art to take on completely opposing perspectives juxtapose them on stage and ha have this dialectic where they're not directly talking to each other but they're talking through me to the audience and so you get both sides of a perspective and the audience is able to see it in a completely different way because the same person literally is giving them two completely opposing perspectives so that at least opens up the listening a bit 
you know, and, and I like to start with humor, pathos, dreams, hopes, fears, all those things that unify us and make people endearing, you know, um, and, you know, inconsistencies and fallibility and all this stuff. And then, then move into, you know, what their political view might be, you know, and usually that's the punchline. What about is with the dialect work is just the, the nature of the dialect gives an instant cue of other. But then by doing lots of them, it broadens our understanding of kind of, is that really other? Is it kind of, we're all a little bit weirdos or none of us right. are weirdos. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, I, I just adore, you know, the inconsistencies, you know, like, like the same guy who was like, this money system's all going to come crashing down is going to then say this, these dolls went for $11,000 in Boston. They're good investment potential, you know, and that's the beauty. That's what makes you fall in love with a character, you know? Because we all have that. An ambulance. Maybe it's obvious, but why an ambulance? And how did you get the ambulance? And was it the one that used in, they used in Ghostbusters? Maybe that was a hearse. No, that was a hearse. Oh, it was Cannibal Run. They used, a, they used an ambulance in Cannibal Run. I, I say she found me. I was looking for a, a vehicle that had a separate cab so I could lock up my recording gear and um, had AC outlets so I could plug it in and... Uh, I looked, opened the LA Times, and right there under cargo vans was an affordable Chevy 85 ambulance. And, you know, ultimately it became a metaphor for the kind of self rescuing act of leaving Hollywood and going out to like seek a truth I could not define. Um, and, you know, I, I, around the turn of the millennium, I was calling this piece USA 911 prior to the attacks because I felt like I was taking my microphone thermometer and sticking it up the ass of America to take their temperature for, you know, millennium fever. And they were all just like, you know, tripping about Y2K. And, you know, everybody was very um, agitated at that point in time. And and the ambulance became not just a metaphor for the self-rescuing act of, ta of leaving Hollywood, but, but a confessional atmosphere, you know, your doctor's office, you're, you're, you open up and the absence of video was also very helpful in the candidness of the resulting interviews. Um, you know, and so, so we got this kind of uh, self-appointed traveling cultural therapist, you know, sitting in my little ambulance, inviting people to tell their stories. And it was really shockingly welcomed um, by people who just don't feel heard. Yeah, and what, 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 is, context, what surprised you most? Some of what surprised you most would maybe were some of those that you said inconsistencies. Some was maybe the degree to which certain people you would not have anticipated opening up, opening up. Anything else really surprised you? Uh, anything else that really surprised me? I, I would, you know, I would say my love for the South surprised me. Falling in love with the woman, that woman that, that whose accent I love so much. You know, one of the things she ended up saying was, oh, we had a lot of people who worked in the house, but when field time came, they hid it, you know. And I realized I'm speaking with a, a plantation owner who is just a, a generation removed from slave ownership, you know, and I she fed me grits and I gave her a hug and she's a sweet old lady, you know. Um, and uh, I'm not saying that, you know, and then I have to grapple with, but slavery, you know? Yeah. <laughs> you know? So yeah, that was surprising to, um, but, to, and transcendent to be able, cause so, you know, the idea is that I don't have to agree with everyone in order to love them. And I think that if we could accept this idea of multiplicity and that in order for me to be right, you don't have to be wrong and we can still love our fellow humans without agreeing with them, um, is imperative to uh, our future. Oh, it's great. It, it's a great takeaway. I just want to say it again to capture it. Maybe you should. We don't. Okay. Pick three dialects and say the the takeaway line. We don't have to agree with one another to love one another. However you put it, which is so beautifully. You, you do whatever. You could choose one voice. You don't have to play. And you're not my trained monkey. You don't have to do it if you don't want to. But I'm inviting you to, <laughs> if you would welcome the invitation, to choose one or more dialects to give that lovely line um <laughs> i keep going back to that old lady 
I and you could do a bunch, right? You could spin many pots and we could pick your favorite, your, your favorite one or three, right? You could, I, it, partly, I just, I just enjoy watching you talk. <laughs> uh, uh, well, I mean, what I say at the end is I don't, I realized I don't hate America. I love America. I, I, I broke bread with them. I, I am them. And even if I can't continue to agree with them all simultaneously, and even if I never agree with any of them ever again, I can still love them. I can still love them. I can still love them. Um, there's a bunch of others in there, but uh, what's been the hardest part what, in in going around your ambulances? Ambulances as if you had a fleet going in your well, ambulance journeys. And did it ever break down on you? Is it yeah. been? Yeah, we rolled into a ditch in Sandusky, Ohio in 1990, the blizzard of 96. Um, and that's when I started procuring different vehicles. Um, but yeah, she looked at me as if to say, after everything we've been through, you're going to leave me in Ohio. Um, yeah, she's very dirty. The other ambulance came and it was like two girls wearing the same dress to the prom. Only mine was dirtier. It was just... She, yeah, so so then I had to do a full R&R &R and like I pull out the engine um, uh, and put it into like a, a rider moving van. And my experience going the rest of the way from Ohio to California in, in a yellow rider moving van and, you know, staying at Motel 6s with the same interior decor and the same things on the menu at all the chain restaurants, as opposed to traveling in an ambulance where people would invite me in to sleep and for dinner and and you know being in the kitchens and the hearts of of people's uh, you know people's backyards it, it was just such a completely different way to travel and uh it made me really appreciate um the ambulance and um i think sometimes you know the the dialects themselves can be the only distinguishing factor if you travel in that con conventional way you know staying at hotels and going to restaurants and stuff um but yeah, I broke down in Ohio and uh, it was irretrievable. And so then I uh, ended up uh, eventually being able to afford a, a, a Volkswagen Westphalia. At one point in time, I had a Eurovan and a Westphalia so I could have a, a four burner stove total um, and lived in the two of them. And then uh, I traveled in a, a sailboat in the Caribbean for a while. Um, and uh, yeah, there were quite a few vehicles. A sailboat? You'd go and yeah. so you'd go island to island. You'd go fishing yeah, boat well, to fishing boat. What I would do is I would book a tour for my um my band at the time was called Eliza Jane and the Barnyard Gypsies. It's this weird kind of like gypsy bluegrass that I play, um and uh, I would book a tour in the places where I wanted to record the dialects. So um and my guitarist at the time had built a fifty six foot trimaran, um that was all pumps like no no electronics or anything it was really really beautiful it's called the virgin fire it was the fastest trimaran in the in the in the caribbean at the time um it's like 2006 through 2009 i was there playing irish tunes and oh saint croix does saint patty's day like nobody's business because there were you know arguably Irish slaves down there um, and that the ah sound like you can hear it in Yaman in the Jamaican you can hear the Irish influence in that accent um, and you know of course all the other colonizers the the Dutch and the French and the Spanish and the English layered on top of each other and then on top of that Irish and West African influence and then you've got like a few remaining I forget if it's the Caribs or the Arawaks but I, I recorded a, a the chief the local chief on Dominica um, but so, so, you know, so I'll book, I'll book the music to pay for the trip and then I'll, you know, send my auditions in via MP3, which back in the day was not as easy as it is now, um, especially from a sailboat, but, um, yeah, trying to use sort of that TV work and the voiceover work and the, and the booking a tour as a musician to fund my dialect habit. What did you learn in all of this? And maybe too broad a question to be useful. But what's the takeaway? What's something that you didn't just go into this and confirm a prior, but in fact, developed your thinking in a way that is worth sharing? And of course, that's what some of the performance is about. But what what's a takeaway that you learned, you drew from the experience? I mean, um, well, like I said, like, like, I was raised to sort of fear and loathe the uh, the South. I was raised in New York, you know, so so for me, like 
feeling that sense of comfort and hospitality and genuine humanity from people that I didn't really see as people, you know, took me out of my own myopic perspective and, and um, just enabled me to really um, embrace humanity on a different level and and you know it it helped me stop labeling people myself also i started off at the, as this sort of petulant liberal very you know self-righteous you know i'm right and you're wrong and i know more than you and and i'm gonna go out and prove my point kind of thing and what i ended up doing was going out and listening and being sort of you know persuaded convinced and converted to 400 conflicting philosophies in rapid succession and forgetting about whether I agreed and more, you know, feeling, you know, it's interesting because I was just asked um, to weigh in on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict by Newsweek. And I'm like, why, why are you asking me? But I, I have gathered enough public opinion to, to have one myself, you know, like I've, I've interviewed 7,000 people and I've really genuinely empathetically listened to them. And I feel, you know, like what they were asking is, you know, is this Israeli Mossad character potentially offensive and uh, that they're coming out with? Um, and I was like, well, yes, but she has the power of regenerative healing and, you know, to transfer her life force to other people. And her her child was killed by uh, terrorists. And so, you know, she has the opportunity, Marvel has the opportunity to use their wide reach and their ability to tap into people's emotions and hearts to show humanity from all sides of this conflict and to have a superhero whose bag it is to save the women and children, regardless of what the governments are doing, you know, and, and to, to value human life and, and healing and love and forgiveness and peace and all these things and you know so um i feel like you know i came out of it with with far more of a humanist perspective than a kind of self-righteous you know i'm right and you're wrong perspective helpful we should get to at least something that's related to public policy kind of that's mm -hmm. related to kind of democracy at its essence and of course humanity is and the takeaway that came in an interview not too long ago that we did was that democracy is at some level a commitment to humility. There's a commitment to believing that my beliefs are not the only beliefs and that somebody's humanity matters even if they disagree with me. Nonetheless, how can you build a governing majority that strongly believes in things that will make people's lives better? How do you at the same time have a political structure that doesn't just feed upon itself and destroy democracy because you're unwilling to police fascism? These are conflicts that we won't get into all of the uh, go down every rabbit hole today, but right. at least wanted to talk about free speech, including free speech absolutism. I am reminded, I'm reminded by Kyle, the producer of the show, of the example set by David Goldberger, the Jewish ACLU lawyer who defended free speech rights of Nazis in right. Illinois in the late 1970s. And I have, and and I, and I have my own views about that, right? I'm not merely what are standing your views up about that. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, I wouldn't do it. That, those are my views. I wouldn't make a law that somebody else couldn't. But the old line that I am now stealing, right, as somebody who, you know, is mostly a recovered lawyer, yeah, everybody's got a right re representation, but they don't got a right to my representation. Exactly. And yeah. and so that's, you know, that's where, that's where, you know, I, I wouldn't do it. Well, and, a valid point because, you know, you only have so much energy and, you know, I, I question my participation in, in, you know, video game franchises that are, you know, training kids to be desensitized to gun violence, Yeah, you know, but then I sort of do this, I, I make up for it by doing a kind of Robin Hood thing where I take the money from that to support the political and, and you know, activist um, art that I put out into the world and to try to get more voices heard. So, um, <clears throat> uh, so and we, and we each have to, we have to each have to make trade-offs, right? Like I, right. I think climate change is real and I drive a Ford F-150, right? My, my hypocrisy is every day. And at the same time, that doesn't remove, I think my responsibility or even my, uh, my, my tiny incy beansy wit, uh, uh, bit rather of, moral authority to say, well, we can make the world a little bit better, right? We can make the world. Right. I, I, I'm, I, I am not perfect, but that doesn't mean we can, I, 
I, I play video games that shoot guns. That doesn't mean I think real people should shoot guns. Uh, I, right. and I, and of course I have shot a gun, that... but I don't think we should have everybody own lots of it, 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 totally unfettered, right. unlicensed ways to kill other people. Uh, you can make yeah. dividing lines on these things. So everybody's been saying one of the, the most most consistent refrains when I suggest positive change and big changes, you know, especially at the beginning of this pandemic of like, OK, now it's finally time. In a, in a very, you know, Greta way, you know, let's stop. And, and that's that's one of the perspectives that I bookend my Freedom of Speech show with is is a, a Navajo elder who says, hey, I want everybody to stop and look at what they're doing and and respect Mother Earth. If we do this, we will survive. And she said this 30 years ago, you know, and I've been saying repeating this for 30 years. And um, people always say, oh, well, you know, that's unrealistic. Nobody's, you know, we maybe we can have change over the course of several decades. Slowly we can weed out cars, but people aren't going to do that. And that's just unrealistic, you know. And then the pandemic hit and they stopped driving their fucking cars. You know, everybody stopped. The plane stopped. The cars stopped. People stopped going to work because they were afraid for their lives. People do and people can make significant instant changes when it's based on it seems to me fear um and you know i also see people make significant changes when it's based on religion and emotion which is why i actually went into entertainment i said when i was a kid i said you know i will have way more effects on on things i believe in and and things uh, making positive change in the world by you know performing uh, something like what Jodie Foster did in The Accused did more for, you know, victims of, of rape than than an article, you know, or or like Sigourney Weaver in Gorillas in the Mist did more for that cause than an article in, in a National Geographic yeah. on your dentist table because they tap in. And this is what I was saying that Marvel could do. They tap into your emotions. People emotions like the root word of emotions and motivation are the same. Right. So people make change based on what they feel and so this this medium of film and entertainment and theater and music i i believe that you know if somebody is going to herald change and champion change uh we've got to start worshiping the goddess again you know we've got to form a new uh, updated religion that that worships gaia and that people are as passionate about as they are about Jesus. Well, I don't want to stop there, although it's a pretty powerful proposal. So you're you're doing a one person show, and what you're really doing is promoting a new religion. No, no, not in the one person show. I'm actually writing a science fiction rave opera about the return of the goddess. So that's a multi character. I am certainly not trying to center myself in any megalomaniacal way. Um, well, I didn't say you were the goddess. I just said you want the. <laughs> You, nor do you have to play the goddess in the one person show or even in the next artistic expression that you work on. Uh, I want to stick to or go back to a little bit the idea of sort of free speech absolutism and ask you. And I'm reminded now of of Elon Musk, right, who's self-proclaimed kind of free speech absolutist, but then bans accounts critical of him and is <laughs> arbitrary in the in, in his decision making and uh, and. You know, if anything, it may indicate that having the wealth and wealth of a nation state uh, unfettered has costs. Do you see limits or if you do, what limits do you see to free speech that are justified, that are real? Uh, yeah, I could say more, but I can also say less. Do I see limits to free speech? Yeah. Um, or, or what limits do you think there should be? Like the the one that now is on the tip of the tongue of blank percentage of Americans who don't cry fire in a crowd to theater, right? Others would others would talk about hate speech. In Germany, they would say, yeah, you don't get to have a swastika because that was a real bad deal around here. Uh, in, in, in England, it goes further. Uh, in people on Twitter, they go further or less far, depending. You know, I am going to exercise my right to not weigh in on that mm. because I don't think it's up to me to censor anyone ever. And I think it, again, it's more in the listening. I mean, yes, I agree on a metaphysical level that there is power in the word that we are giving like physical vibration and uh, um, 
um, to and and therefore creating power and energy and focused energy by saying words, but they're still words, you know. So I think that any time you start telling people that they can't say words, um, you get into trouble, and then you have this issue of control where you know one individual is controlling what comes out of the mouth of another person, which stops the breathing and creates fear. And, you know, I, I think that if the listening is able to not give power to the hate speech, then the hate speech is, can be irrelevant in that context, you know, because you can dismiss it, you know? Um, but I, I, I don't, I don't feel as though I have the authority to determine what other people are and are not allowed to say. I am a linguist. I'm a dialectologist. I like to listen to the nonverbal as well as the verbal, everything that comes out, the musicality. There's so much about how we communicate that has nothing to do with the words. You know, so if you start censoring the words themselves, then maybe we would have to get into how those words are said, which certainly, you know, destroys a lot of marriages. You know, it's it's what, what I ended up teaching after going deep into dialects and sounds was um, power voice for lawyers, mostly female lawyers, empowering your voice and identifying that upward cadence. And I went into some research by uh, Dr. Rosario Signorello over at, at UCLA on the charismatic voice where they eliminated the verbiage and just played back the music of world leaders and leaders of Fortune 500 companies and determined that they used a wider musical range. The most charismatic speakers have the musical range of, of a singer. And so I mean, I think that if you're looking at power and influence and what could create change and what could inhibit and hurt people, you know, I think you have to look at all of it, not just the words that are being said. And then and then you have to think about, you know, we're only dealing with the English language here. What about all of the other languages? What what happens? What gets lost and changed in translation? What about what's in print? You know, so I think there are so many variables and nuance nuances and an other forces in in communication that don't have to do with the exact words that you're saying that if you get so myopic as to, to be like oh well you can't say this word um or you can't say this word in this context people will find another way to communicate their hate you know so so i, I would say stopping the communication is not the answer it's a that's the that's an answer I was looking for. Your answer was what the answer I was looking for, and I appreciate <laughs> your answer. Uh, I want to give but you a I'm chance. I'm not to... saying. <laughs> no, I am. <laughs> the, so I'm not going to answer that question, and then I'm not going to answer that question for a few minutes, <laughs> which, which, which is great. Uh, let me ask, and we should wrap. And so, so then, actually, let, let's plug the show. Then, yeah, go ahead. It, it's January sixth. You give. You so didn't. here's what's cool about January 6th. I've been doing this play for 30 years um, and uh, it's been all over the world. And it's uh, what's cool about the 6th is we're, we're number one, it's going to be an amazing experience because it's the Alberta Abbey and they have an incredible mission statement about getting unsung voices heard in this community. And the vibe there is always incredible. But uh, I also have several indigenous musicians performing, including a guy by the name of Quilt Man and uh, Rosa Linda, who is an amazing singer, singing her original music, opening the show at 730. And she's going to be joining me on the panel, as are several other indigenous musicians, uh, with Joe Bezeghi, who is uh, the executive director, I believe, of Recovery Works, and um, Andy Miller, who's the executive director of Our Just Future, which is a social service organization. Of course, you, Jefferson, are going to be there on this panel, and moderating will be Stephen Robinson who um, is a political writer and a, the play typer guy, and he's just got a great perspective and a great voice. It's gonna be a vibrant post-show conversation. And the show itself, um, we used to call it evolving portraits of a re revolving portraits of an evolving nation, because essentially what's happened, it's kind of a weird medium. It's documentary theater, but because I memorized all of the interviews I did 
ad nauseum. Like each of the interviews in this 90 minute show were originally up to an hour each. So I have like 32 hours of stuff in my head of, of the, the words of other people. So their their stories change like a teacher would change slightly how they tell their story to different classes of people, um, classrooms full of people. Um, so So I don't know if I'm the best person to describe this because I'm so like in it. But um, yeah, I'll do a bunch of tricks. I do 34 voices. It's fun. And it's a live webcast. It's going to be recorded. You will be that live studio audience. And I would just love to see you there and meet you and um, join the party afterwards. Liza Jane Schneider, voice actress, dialect coach, doing 34 voices out of many, many, many voices she has done. Writer and star of her one-person performance, Freedom of Speech. Thanks for being with us, Eliza. My pleasure. Thanks for having me, and I look forward to having you on the panel. And thanks for being a democracy nerd. Yeah, of course. Nerds! Nerds! Hey, you guys, hey, nerds! Hey, listen to democracy nerds! Nerds! <laughs>